Good day, good day, friends. What a wonderful time it is for me to be with my special friends once again and to be afforded the opportunity to deliver my oral thoughts, my nuggets, things that I've learned as I journey through this beautiful life of mine. Oh, I see we have some visitors here. Greeting to you. We hope you enjoy this presentation and you are in the company of wonderful and respectful friends. You know, for decades, I wondered what I could do to express my gratitude and my appreciation to my former classroom scholars, and now they have become my lovable and adorable friends. Well, my heart and mind came together and said, talk about information that you have learned and things that you have given birth to as you proceeded through life and maybe put it into a speech and that should be inspirational to them. I said, great idea, I'll call it a commencement speech and I'll give it a title, a prescription for a lifetime of happiness and success. Outlive your precious life. Now, let me introduce myself. I am Clifton A. Castillo, an author, a former educational researcher, and a former educational practitioner, better known as a classroom teacher. Let me preface something first, and this is personal, to my former classroom students. I want to thank each of you for coming my way and for the peace of mind that each of you gave me when we were together in the classroom. And because of your righteous and because of your respectful behaviors, I was able to regain my self-worth. I was able to regain my self-dignity again. And you know what? You had such a ravenous appetite for knowledge. I'm so proud of each of you. And you know I learned so much by being in the classroom with you all. I learned how to be more compassionate, how to trust people. And this is golden. And I also learned to some degree how to control my emotions. So you say, what is the big deal about giving this commencement speech? Why are you giving this? Why are you talking to us? We're supposed to be respectful. Well, that doesn't happen all the time, now does it? Well, consider this contrast, and I think it's worth noting. Before I became a classroom teacher, I was employed as a manager with one company and another major company. I was uh, employed as a personnel supervisor. However, I was given little or no respect by these companies. And as a result of this unethical behavior by my colleagues, I adopted self-loathing. I concluded that life was not worth living and it wasn't worth living for me. I'm going to give up on life in fairness. Well, just as I was getting ready to file my bankrupt papers in the courts of respectability and fairness, Lady Faith came to me and she suggested that I give teaching a try. She said, you will get the respect and dignity that is due you. Trust me, she said. Lady Faith said, I know you will be an outstanding mentor and I think you have the right sense of humor to have a fruitful classroom. But I said, no way, Lady Faith. It is not for me. I'll never enter a classroom. And besides, no one feels that teaching is important. Well, Lady Faith, being wise like all women, she vouched, you will be important to your students and you will feel important and know this, you will not only help your students with their academic material that's necessary for them to be able to earn a profitable living in life. More importantly though, you will demonstrate elements that are necessary for them to be able to live in life as good and decent citizens, how to get along with others. And you will do this by being compassionate and respectful to them in the classroom. Trust me. Well, I became a classroom teacher. Lady Faith was correct. I became alive. I began loving myself. And you know what? I started singing songs of happiness and respect. And I said, life, you are worth living for me. And I never wanted my classroom tenure to end. But 
there's always someone jealous of us. And the person that was jealous of me was none other than old man illness who claimed he had other plans for me, better plans for me. And of course, I knew that this was not the case because I was very happy. Well, we have all heard this. You cannot always get what you want, but I certainly got most of what I wanted by being in the classroom with each one of you, my former classroom scholars. You gave me fairness, dignity, and respect, and I am ever so grateful. And this happiness transcended to my outside life. I was happy. Oh, did I start doing volunteer work? Now, this is a statement I wish I didn't have to make. Please remember our special friends in your prayers. I'm talking about Heather and Brian, who lives ended much too soon. Yet, we can take solace in the fact that they left us with wonderful and lasting memories. Heather and Brian outlived their precious and young lives. And we remember their kindness and their lovely personalities, and we carry it in our grateful hearts. We are indeed indebted to their families for sharing their golden years with us. Now, a prescription for a lifetime of happiness and success. Outlive your precious life. Now, like all prescriptions, like all medicines, there could be a few side effects here. However, in this case, I do believe when you consume this medicine, the efficacy of taking this medicine will outweigh any unpleasant trees. But I must caution you, don't take this medicine with alcohol. You won't remember anything. Now, you can get this prescription filled at any time, cost you nothing. All right, let me begin my commencement speech to you, my former scholars. Always be in love. You do everything you can to feel loved. It is the only commodity that has been given to each of us equally and freely from the very first time we took our breath. And from that time on, we have yearned to be loved. Let someone love you, which sometimes can be rather difficult because there are times when it's difficult for us to love ourselves. When you love yourself, though, you can love others. Loving someone is never a mistake if you choose the right person and love that person in the right way and at the right time and for the right reason. And the rest can be as easy as making duck soup. Of course, one must know when to hold on and when to let go. However, I must caution you that a person who is in love with himself or herself will leave little room for someone else to love. Love yourself, but do not be in love with yourself. To be loved, you must be lovely. Make a ritual of letting someone know every day that you love them, that you adore them. And if this is the case, it will be their antidote to war off unhappiness and everything good can come in. Choose to be happy. People who are happy chose to be. Their happiness did not happen by chance. And if you are happy, you want others to be happy, just as you are, even if it's by default. But be mindful that no one should always desire to be happy and contented. If this were so, there would be no energies to obtain new goals and new challenges and to garner new relationships that all could be better than what you have at the present. You can only be happy. I'll, I'll say that again. You can only be happy when you decide that you can live without that special something that you truly wanted, that something that you prayed for all your life and didn't get. Life is a banquet table full of everything wonderful, everything that a person needs to be successful and happy is on that table. And everything on that table is free and open to the public. Select what you want, something that you know you'll need, those commodities that will bring you success. However, now, later on, if you conclude that you did not choose the right commodity, you may 
may return. Being moral and virtuous should not be choices that you have to contemplate. They should be part of your empathetic and sympathetic way. Of course, there will be times when life forces a person to choose between good and evil. And when you notice those elements of unrighteousness attempting to leave their station, quickly lock the door so your righteous and respectful behaviors can just flow out to everyone. Never utter, I am okay, but you are not okay. How about, I am okay and you are okay. People are as decent as their conscience will permit them to be. And it is not us who tell our conscience how to be. Our conscience directs us. You would be wise to stay clear of controversial thoughts. It will be a waste of your energy competing with senseless and fruitless debates and confrontations. Nobody ever wins and friendships might be destroyed. If you must continue to defend your moral character, remember this, at some juncture there will come a point when you will decide to let a defamation go because to chase it down would be to waste a piece of your precious life being entangled in a futile door with ignorance. You will realize that it is your own approval that is rewarding enough for you. Be grateful for those positive enterprises that seem so mundane and so insignificant to you. In time, they will add up to a bucket full of wonderful blessings. However, be aware and prepare yourself that they may not be permanent. Take ownership of your missteps and do not blame others for your shortcomings. You will never grow by blaming others. Humble yourself and humble others and say this, this is what I am at the present and this is what I hope to be tomorrow. I will be better tomorrow than I have been. Please, won't you give me another chance to be better? And they will. Be patient with others. They extend the same courtesy to you and more often than you can imagine. Fear should not alter your decision to travel down that road that is so unfamiliar to you. Polish your courage daily and this will mitigate your fear. Courage means that you're willing to take a chance to get what you really want because you know that if you do not have courage, you will never know if you could have obtained those things that you want. Take a moral stance about something that you are concerned about or something that you should be concerned about. If you say nothing or do nothing, then you are being indifferent and this behavior is worse than hatred. Let me remind you what the poet George Bernard Shaw thought when he compared hatred to that of being indifferent. He said, the worst sin towards our fellow creatures is not to hate them, but to be indifferent to them. And that is the essence of inhumanity. Allow me to put my spin on that statement. When a person exercises hatred, there's action there. People are being acknowledged, they do exist. And possibly dialogues can take place and perhaps the chords can be reached. However, if a person is indifferent, such a person ignores everything. It doesn't concern me, they say. That's not about me. I must warn you though, that if you do decide to exercise hatred, be aware that it will suck the love out of your compassionate and precious heart. And your hatred behavior will demand to be fed a large helping of righteousness and vile food every day if it is to sustain itself. And when you get ready to consume any fluids, it will say mix some lies in there so all of this can go down better. People who hate know little about their victims, if anything. But it makes them feel better by hating others. It covers up their insecurities. It polishes their uh, station in life that they don't want and they're not happy with. 
Know your prejudice and see if your thoughts are valid. Try to suppress them. We all have our prejudice. We have learned how to suppress them and don't be judgmental. If you notice that you're always alone and your heart always empty and this is not what you desire, well, it's probably because you feel that you're too perfect. When you become angry and bitter with someone for good reasons, and we all do from time to time, do you know how and when to express your anger? Well, let me state what Aristotle said about when he compared anger. He said, anybody can become angry. That is easy. But to be angry with the right person and to the right degree and at the right time and for the right purpose and in the right way, that is not within everybody's power and it is not easy. You should not make a habit of judging others because you will never have sufficient information to do so. Just have your opinion and thus he will not have the urge to set in judgment and exercise punishment as a judge does. And know this, 95% of everything that's in your head is false. It's junk. Statistics have proven this. Consider this. Suppose you thought that everyone who has an unusual hairstyle, you believe they were immoral, not very intelligent, but later on you find out how wrong you were, that it's just the opposite. Well, that thinking is part of that 95% of junk to see many in your brain. Be compassionate and give your energies to the less fortunate, to the downtrodden. They too have their autobiographies to be shared. Now, before you state, I cannot save the world. I am just one person. Well, that's fair enough. However, listen to what the noted poet William Hale would say to you. He would say you are one. And because you are only one, you cannot do everything. But you can do something. And because you cannot do everything, you should not refuse to do that something that you can do. Make a genuine effort to exercise kindness and understand politeness to everyone you meet. Do it daily. It could be done with a searching smile. Everybody knows that if you smile at another person, they'll smile back at you. Or it could be just some warm greetings. We know that everything nice sticks to the heart. Negative things go to the mind. And nothing you'll ever do for someone is small. But fair warning to you that if you exercise empathy and sympathy and respect for everyone else every day, you're going to become an addict. Your heart will always seek to be compassionate. It will need that food. And going to rehab will do you no good. If you do not exercise self-discipline, society will do it for you. With self-discipline, we solve most problems. With no discipline, we solve nothing. Listen to what I believe. Self-discipline involves knowing when and how to do things that are important to you. Things that's going to bring you happiness and success. Case in point, suppose you had two chores that are standing before you. The one chore is very difficult and you dread doing it. The other difficult, uh, excuse me, other chore is very pleasurable and enjoyable to you. So which chore should you undertake first? Well, if you do the chore that is pleasant, that you love doing, if you do that first, chances are you will not enjoy its fruits. Why? You're going to be worrying about that difficult chore that you have to do, the one that you dread doing. So I suggest that you satisfy the dreaded and difficult task first. Know that your life will always be balanced. There will always be a counterbalance scale there. It would be prudent for you to occasionally take self-inventory. Examine the unconscious mind and ask, why was I put here? Am I being all I can be? Am I being happy? Am I satisfied with my job? Now, after analyzing your mind, and if you conclude that I'm not happy, I'm not contented, well, I would suggest that you get up before you get 
sores and blisters and go out and find that something, that circumstance that you want. Use some energies and if you can't find it, then you should make those commodities become a reality. It's out there, you gotta find it. Know that every decision that you make will come with a consequence. There is no decision that is neutral. Every man you meet will be your student as well as your teacher. Approach people as if they are decent. You don't know if they are not decent, so approach them in this manner. You would be foolish to believe people are immoral and unethical because you think they are or because they don't look the way you want them to look or act the way you want them to act. Respect people. You don't have to love them. It's so difficult loving someone that we want to love. Just respect them. And know this, there's a little bit of you in every man you meet. When engaged in conversations with someone who is doleful and depressed, never offer your advice unless it is asked for, and then be prudent with your oral thoughts. In most cases, all that is needed is a sympathetic ear. People do not expect for you to know all the answers they are seeking. They just want you to listen. And never should you say, I know how you feel. That same thing happened to me. Let me tell you what you do. Or say, time heals everything. No time does not heal everything for everyone. And no, you don't know how they feel. We grieve differently for different things. How about saying this? I am here for you. Please let me do something for you. Never should you say, if you need me, text me. If you need me, call me. I'll see what I can do. And never should you say, I understand how you feel. That's an insult. No, you don't. Know how and when to apologize. Today we are bombarded with people who make a backhanded attempt to apologize after sharing unethical thoughts about someone. Know this, first you must ask a victim if you have his or her permission to extend your apology. Carefully think what you want to say to that person that you have offended and end it with saying, I was wrong. Why? Apologizing only means that you're sorry for making your harsh statement in public. But that doesn't mean that you don't believe what you said or you wouldn't have said it. But if you say I was wrong, no place to go. When you feel unworthy of yourself, write yourself a beautiful letter stating all the positive things that you know about yourself that others don't know. Address the letter to you, put a stamp on it, mail it, and when it arrives to your place, slowly open it and read those beautiful words that you know about yourself. Extremely important for me, this particular statement. Parents and future parents, love your children. You can never give them too much love. It will be the greatest gift you'll ever give them. Make sure you offer guidance to your children or they will fall short and it will not be the fault of your children. Rather, the onus falls upon you, the parent. And let me remind you of what the noted poet Victor Hugo believed. He said, if the soul is left in darkness, sins will be committed. The guilty one is not he who commits the sin, but he who causes the darkness. Simply put, I think we can correlate uh, that particular statement to being a parent. As a loving parent, you must not only tell your child that you love him or her and that you respect him or her, but just as importantly, you must show all of this to your child and you must do it every day. However, if you fail to provide the necessary guidance that encompasses knowing how to be ethical, to be respectful to others, be responsible. How to have manners, i.e., thank you, I am sorry, I appreciate. If you do not challenge them to be their best, if you do not teach them how to handle adversity, adversity, adversity excuse me, and how to have pride in themselves, well, I can tell you, these challenges 
that you did not give them these elements, it will be the equivalent of leaving your child in total darkness if you do not exercise these virtuousness to your child. And your child will be left in total darkness and it is possible sins will be committed and they will be unruly and unprepared for life. Never permit someone's negative words and their vicious labels to define you, to define your race, or to define your gender. Don't permit their vicious statements to be the reason for your failure. You know, I don't know if I should, but I'm going to add this. Perhaps it wouldn't hurt the spirit's soul to say a few prayers now and then, even if you do not believe in the divine one. Because praying seems to strengthen the physical and spiritual souls. Listen to this. Mega research has proven this. They tracked 10,000 patients with a terminal illness. And those who prayed daily had less pain and they lived months longer than those who did not pray. When you find yourself on oceans of turbulence and chaos, set your moral internal navigational instruments to steer your conscious to the north shores of decency and virtuousness. And please, don't dock at any port in a storm. In life, from the time a man is born until his departure, he is given the chance to contribute to his life story. He can be an actor who can write his own script. He can be his own producer, be his own director as he performs on the stages of life. However, he cannot be his own audience or give his own unbiased reviews. His performance will not always receive a standing ovation, although it was worthy of one. However, there will be times when his performance is less than stellar, and yet he will be given a standing ovation. Praise will be given to him. But what is most paramount here is that such a man should always give his best performance on the stages of achievement, accountability, morality, and everything that he knows is decent. A moral man realizes that being ethical and decent is a lifelong struggle. But if a man can achieve these elements of virtuousness, he has outlived his precious and golden life. Train yourself to take time to read something every day and read something that's not parallel to your thinking. When we read, we learn knowledge and we also unlearn what we thought we read. You know, when your golden years are upon you, my friends, I hope you never have to ask, where's the life I have lost in living? This means you are not satisfied with your life and your life achievements. And you are now pondering your mind with queries such as, if only I would have, why didn't I take that chance? Why did I live my life without love? I wish I could have told that person every day how much I love that person. Well, all your wishing and praying and pleading will not, will not let you go back in time. Not even a single minute back in time. And to know that you wasted your life is worse than having a terminal illness that you had nothing to do with. You can live with that. On the other hand, trying to live with choices that you did not make is gut-wrenching. This concludes my oral thoughts. I must extend a heartfelt thank you to Miss Lucy Thomas for giving me permission to use her song, Memory, in this presentation. Visitors like me on Facebook and educators, you may go to my internet website, cliftonacastile.com, and there you'll be able to download all my published educational articles for peer review. Cost you nothing, especially if you're a Caucasian teacher teaching African American students. Now, precious friends, loving spouses, wonderful people in the community, wonderful parents, it is my desire that you will always continue to have that it. What is it? IT. Well, it encompasses compassion, understanding, empathy, sympathy, honesty, forgiveness, respect, wisdom, knowledge, and everything that is good. 
and I hope you will have this it. And if you do, you would have outlived your life. And people will remember you, not for being a sergeant in the army of humanity, but they'll say he was a general in the army of humanity. Now, this is so heartfelt for me, and I'm going to try to get through it. And if you're here visitors, you might want to close your ears. So often when I examine and take self-inventory of my golden and precious life, I wonder what would have happened to me if we had never met you, my former scholars and my adorable friends, uh, if we had not shared good times. What if you would have been mean-spirited to me and disrespectful? What would have happened to me? Would I have this golden and fruitful and wonderful life that I have at the present? When I think of where I came from and where I almost ended up because of people, people's unethical behavior directed to me, and what if I would not have the courage to believe in life and listen to Lady Faith? Where would I be today? You say, what are you talking about? What is this? Let me see, can I give you a quick analogy? Suppose you were uh, in a relationship with someone that was mistreating you daily and you went to someone else and they treated you fairly. When you give praise to the person who treated you fairly. And let me continue on. A man's greatest conviction is knowing he is respected, that he is valued, and that he is loved. He cannot succeed without friends and people who believe in him. A man's soul yearns for the commodities of love and respect forever. And you, my precious friends, are still giving that to me. You gave me back me. And I am ever so respectful. You know, when I say my prayers, I ask the divine one not to erase my memories. Oh no, when my body starts ravishing from me. Because those memories that you have helped give me are so precious in my life. And I hope you will always say, I am proud to be alive and I am proud to be me, just me. And if so, you would have outlived your precious and golden and fruitful life, my friends, please. to